All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? It's right at 12 o'clock. I have a few announcements to get things going here. Welcome everyone to Medical Grand Rounds at the University of Colorado. Really happy to see you all here in Shroffle Auditorium. Um, as a little bit of a teaser for those uh, considering coming in the next few weeks, on February 21st, we're going to welcome our own Dr. Lavanya Kundapali, who will be talking about the hot topic of cardio-oncology. And then on February 28th, we're going to welcome Dr. Sarah Rowan, who is ID faculty at Denver Health, the Chief Medical Officer for Jefferson County Public Health, to speak about the management of infections associated with injection drug use. Um, as a reminder, CME and MOC credits are posted up here. I think that's been up there long enough. Uh, a little reminder, we are taking nominations for speakers for Grand Rounds for this coming year. Both of these QR codes will show up in the chat if you don't get to hit them right now, but please feel free to nominate speakers. We'll be making that list in the coming weeks. And before I welcome today's speaker, I wanna talk about the Wallstrom Lectureship itself. Uh, this is a lecture dedicated to the work and the generosity of Mats and Agneta Wallstrom. Uh, their gift, their incredibly generous gift, has funded both this lectureship as well as the Wallstrom Endowed Chair in Nephrology. Their goal with this gift uh, was to fund clinical research in nephrology to advance our field and also to bring a leader from across the world to our campus annually with the goal of improving not only what we do in clinical care, but also what we do in clinical research as well as the basic sciences. Uh, and I really can think of no better person to honor Matt Sinaknetta's wishes uh, than our speaker today, Dr. Jenny Fleith. Dr. Fleith is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's the Vice Chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at UNC, and she's the Medical Director of the UNC Hospital Dialysis Service. She did her undergrad work at uh, another school that's near UNC, uh, where she graduated cum laude in history. She was a medical student at the University of North Carolina, and then she was an intern and resident at OHSU in Portland. Her fellowship training was in nephrology at Brigham and Women's and the MGH Combined Program, where she also got a master's in public health at the Chan School while she was a fellow. At UNC, Dr. Flight is involved in the management of acute and chronic renal diseases uh, with a focus on hemodialysis patients. Uh, she does that both at the UNC Hospital Kidney Center as well as its associated outpatient dialysis facilities. Her research interests include identifying and understanding modifiable mortality determinants among maintenance dialysis patients and developing innovative treatment strategies to reduce those risks. Her work focuses on dialysis hemodynamics, fluid management, and blood pressure patterns among chronic hemodialysis patients. She also incorporates a lot of patient-centered outcomes and patient preferences into her work with a goal of ensuring that patient stated preference and priorities drive her outcome research. She's an active member of a number of renal and kidney societies across the world including the American Society of Nephrology, the National Kidney Foundation, the Cadigo Group, and the NIH through committee work, working groups, advisory panels, and study sections. She's an associate editor for Kidney 360 and a real tireless mentor and educator. Uh, all of those credentials would take too long for me to read from the podium today. So I will just start by saying uh, it really is an honor to welcome you, Dr. Flight. All right, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It is truly an absolute pleasure to be here. I want to thank Dr. Chanchal for inviting me. And I also want to thank the Wallstroms, not only for endowing this lecture, but for showing us just tremendous hospitality at their home last night. So Matt's Wallstrom worked in the healthcare industry for 30 to 40 years. And seven of those years he spent as the co-CEO of Fresenius Medical Care North America which is a large dialysis organization. This talk today uh, will give you an idea of how you might can use research, policy, stakeholder engagement, um, as well as the resources and reach of healthcare delivery organizations like Fresenius to drive population level outcomes. My disclosures. All right, so we are gonna give you an overview of the dialysis care in the United States. And then I'll spend some time talking about how you can leverage specifically effectiveness implementation research to impact population health. And we'll look at two examples of hybrid effectiveness implementation trials. And we'll close by considering some principles in terms of how we can meaningfully engage stakeholders in our research, policy, and program development. 
But first, I want to pause and give some gratitude and express my appreciation to some of my patient partners over the years. These are individuals who've lived with kidney disease and have partnered with me in my research, many of them for the last 10 years. Three of them, Celeste, Richard, and Derek, were involved in early research and have all since passed from untimely from complications of kidney disease, Derek most recently in October of 23. Precious and Carolyn remain involved in my work. It's individuals like these, as well as individuals that I care for in dialysis clinics that are sources of enormous inspiration to me, but it's really their resilient spirits and their stories that are the heart of this presentation. So in the United States, there are about 450,000 people who receive maintenance hemodialysis. They're more like 3 million worldwide. Caring for these patients is incredibly expensive. So in 2021, Medicare costs were about 35 billion for this population. That calculates out to be about 99,000 per person per year, which is about nine times the amount of money it takes to care for a Medicare insured person who is not on dialysis. But despite that investment, outcomes are really not so great and they have not necessarily improved that much over the years. And in fact, about 20% of patients die by the time they've been on therapy for one year. And then after five years of therapy, only about 40% of patients survive. But beyond that, and more importantly, being on dialysis is hard. It's hard on patients and it's hard on their families. This is data from a survey of close to 5,000 patients. Patients describe the impact of dialysis on their lives. There were physical impacts, fatigue, memory problems, pruritus, psychological impacts, depression, anxiety, and life impacts, ability to work, ability to go to school. So dialysis interferes with social relationships. Oftentimes our patients experience a loss of productivity and financial stability, resulting in, for many patients, a lower quality of life. So one of the pioneers of dialysis, Willem Koff said, if we're gonna keep patients alive by artificial means, we then incur the responsibility to see that it is a good life and an enjoyable life. And some might say that we haven't lived up to this charge. But what I'm going to tell you over the coming slides is that we have a policy environment as well as a healthcare delivery environment that is really primed to change that. So a little bit about the regulatory and policy environment that governs dialysis care in the United States. In 1972, uh, CMS extended Medicare coverage to all people with chronic kidney failure, making it only the second disease state where patients with the condition are eligible for Medicare regardless of their age. ALS is the other one. And then in 1983, uh, CMS introduced a prospective payment system with facility payments that were comprised of a composite rate for bundled services, so that's the dialysis procedures that were being provided, and then additional payments for medications and labs that the facilities billed for that they needed to care for the patients. But in the ensuing years, the population of dialysis patients grew exponentially. And in fact, between 1983 and 2011, it quadrupled in size. And the other thing that happened was the patient population changed. They had more comorbid conditions and we started dialyzing older patients, leading to a robust rise in cost. So around 2 billion in 1983, when this program was initially started, rose to more than 30 billion by 2011. So as a cost cutting or as a way to control costs, CMS expanded this bundle that they pay for the services to, for, to many dialysis related medications and labs. And so what this means is for a facility to care for a patient, when they are paid by Medicare, they get a set amount of money that covers the dialysis procedure, but it also covers the associated medication and labs. So it constrains their cost. Additionally, uh, they instituted what is called the Instage Kidney Disease Quality Incentive Program. It was the first of its type um, pay for performance program in Medicare. And under this program, a portion of clinic payments are linked to the performance of that clinic on clinical quality measures. So we're gonna dock your pay if you don't take care of the patients well. And this was important given that costs were being constrained by these bundled payments. 
And in addition, in 2015, to increase transparency around outcomes, uh, CMS began posting what they call star ratings on a public website that's called the Dialysis Facility Compare website. So this is kind of like restaurant ratings, but for dialysis clinics, you can go look at the outcomes of the, the dialysis clinic where you're gonna go. So the quality incentive program, the goal of the program is to improve patient outcomes by providing financial incentives. And in order to do that, the program has to be composed of measures that are quantifiable, they have to be reportable, they have to be measurable, and they also have to be deemed within the control of the facility. So the existing quality incentive program consists of clinical care measures, care coordination measures, safety measures, and one patient and family engagement measure. And what you can see from this is that the clinical care measures are weighted more heavily. So the docked payments are heavier if you don't meet the clinical care measures. Now, how does a measure become a measure? It takes many years for a measure to end up in the quality incentive program. So typically what happens is CMS will convene a technical expert panel to review the evidence and to discuss what might be appropriate clinical and other types of measures to consider. Measures are then developed and they're sent to the National Quality Forum, which is a nonpartisan group that reviews and endorses measures. And then CMS ultimately will select a measure, often selecting ones, but not always, that have been endorsed by the National Quality Forum. Now we're gonna come back to that, but I'm gonna shift a little bit just to give you an overview of what dialysis delivery in the United States is like. So dialysis care is delivered in facilities that are owned by private organizations, meaning they're not government owned facilities like they are in many countries around the world. There are over 7,500 of these in the United States and its territories, and more than 75% of those facilities are owned by one of two for-profit dialysis organizations, one of which is headquartered here in Denver and the other is headquartered in Germany. So these organizations are characterized by really strong infrastructures. They've got good regulatory support, they've got implementation capability, and they also have shareholders. So performance matters and money matters. But I think that that's the case um, with most things in life. So CMS publishes what they call the conditions for coverage. And this is essentially establishes the requirements for facilities to receive their Medicare payments. Under the conditions of coverage, it's required that in each dialysis clinic, there be an interdisciplinary team who takes care of the patients. It's composed of a nephrologist, a nurse, a social worker, a dietitian, and a patient care technician. So we've got the CMS governed regulatory environment. We've got dialysis being delivered by these large dialysis organizations. And then we have thousands of clinics underneath of them caring for these 450,000 hemodialysis patients in the US. So in order to deliver safe and effective care, meet CMS requirements, and remain financially solvent, many dialysis uh, organizations depend on clinical protocols to support care delivery. And protocols can be very helpful in this regard. They aim to standardize practice and improve guideline adherence. They're intended to reduce patient harm because they reduce variability. They can improve evidence through adoption of evidence or improve outcomes by encouraging adoption of evidence-based strategies. And they also set expectations, increase accountability of the care teams. And another byproduct is they often reduce cost. So it's this idea of extending universality through standardization, which is really important when you're thinking about caring for people at a population level. So I'm gonna take you through one example of how a clinical quality measure in the QIP can drive clinical protocols at dialysis organizations and how in relatively short periods of time that can impact thousands of patients. And we don't say that very often uh, in medicine. There are not many ways in many specialties to reach thousands of patients in a short period of time. So a little background. So when we do hemodialysis, there are essentially three main things that we're doing. We're removing metabolic waste. Um, we're replenishing buffers and balancing electrolytes. And we're also removing excess fluid via ultrafiltration. And for many years, those top two bullets were the focus. So as long as we could get adequate clearance, people's electrolytes looked okay, then that was adequate or sufficient treatment. But over the years, it became clear that there had probably been under focus on the impact of volume management on outcomes. 
And so there was a series of studies um, between 2006 and 2011 um, that showed that the rate of fluid removal may impact patient outcomes. And I wanna point out to you that these are three observational studies. That is not a typo. These are not randomized trials. These are observational studies that showed an association between more rapid fluid removal and a higher risk of mortality. And this became of interest to the community. So this is some of that data. Um, this is data that was done from a post-hoc analysis of data from a clinical trial that was performed in the United States. And what we found was that ultrafiltration rates that were greater than 13 mils per hour per kg were associated with a higher risk of cardiovascular and all-cause mortality and hospitalizations. We repeated this analysis in some real-world dialysis data and again found that patients that were exposed to higher ultrafiltration rates had an iteratively higher risk of all-cause mortality. So ultrafiltration rates may be an attractive quality measure. It's quantifiable. That's a number, 13, that I just gave you. And some would argue that it's facility controlled. So there are two ways to lower ultrafiltration rates. One of those is you can just extend the length of the treatment so you have longer to take off the amount of fluid that was gained. And the other is you can limit the amount of weight that patients gain between treatments. So arguably this could be tied to how well you educate patients about their salt and fluid restrictions. I can tell you the latter of those is really difficult, but those are the two levers that you have to pull if you wanna lower your ultrafiltration rates. So this is the story of the ultrafiltration rate clinical quality measure. So I told you that um, these observational studies that were published, the first two were published in 2006 and 2007. During that period of time, there were continued rising costs and there was growing appreciation that many of these costs were actually stemming from fluid related complications, specifically fluid related hospitalizations. And so CMS convened one of those technical expert panels that I told you about. They did this in 2010, and it was to review the evidence around fluid management and to discuss potential measures. In 2011, we published the third paper, which identified that 13 mils per hour per kg. And then in 2012, like I showed you on the timeline, that's when the end stage uh, kidney disease quality incentive program took place. But what happened clinically was back really beginning around 2011, the dialysis organization started developing clinical protocols around fluid management. And some of that impetus for that was the fact that they knew that CMS was talking about quality measures in this space and that they knew as an organization, they needed to have clinical protocols to be able to deal with this. Certainly it was impacting their patients, but there was also potentially going to be a measure associated with it. So then in 2014, the National Quality Forum, they reviewed two fluid-related quality measures and they endorsed one of them. And then in 2016, in the CMS's final rule, which is published in the, public, in the Federal Register, there was a UF rate measure that was added to the 2020 QIP. And that went into effect in 2020. It's what we call a reporting measure, which is how all of these measures start, where they just prove that they can collect the data from the dialysis clinics. And then they typically move on to being clinical measures. Um, but this is an example of how really in the span of just eight years, they went from an idea to having a measure in the QIP. So what happened with ultrafiltration rates during this period of time? Back in 2010, the national average was about 9.3 mils per hour per kg. And that's actually pretty high when you consider a national mean for these rates. Some patients have rates that are as low as four. And then what happened over time is it dropped 15% between 2010 and 2018. And that was really a direct result of the institution of these volume management protocols and the increased focus on volume in clinics. And so I make this point just to show you that the dialysis delivery system is a powerful one. If there's something that they want to go after, they can reach populations. And this is just an example of it. But an ultrafiltration rate is just that. It's a number. It doesn't tell you anything about the patient experiences that are happening. And what we know from volume management is that patients have really unpleasant experiences. Because we don't have very good objective measures of volume status, we're often trying to guess what a patient's dry weight is. How much fluid should we take off? We don't want to leave them too heavy. So what happens is we're trying to strike this balance between having these higher ultrafiltration rates that the QIP just told me I don't want to have and the associated um, issues around low blood pressure 
we're trying to balance that with leaving patients' volume expanded. And what we see is that patients really experience this. So in some qualitative work, one patient told us, as soon as the cramps start, I'm yelling. You never die, but it's so painful that you think you do. So this patient shows up for treatment three times a week to experience a symptom that makes her feel like she's going to die. On the other end of the spectrum, patients get volume overloaded, which also has a substantial impact on their well-being. Another patient told us, I just kind of panic when I can't get a deep breath. It feels like I'm going to smother. So these patient experiences are not captured in the clinical measures, which are all numbers. It also brings up this issue of there being some potential downsides to protocols. I told you some of the upsides earlier, um, but some people would argue that when you're delivering protocolized care to large populations, that there can be a perceived loss of clinician autonomy and decision-making. And that's a mouthful just to say, it takes away the ability of a physician to individualize their care to the patient that's sitting in the chair in front of them. And there also can be this loss of individualization of care. So we interviewed patients and clinicians about their experience around dialysis. One patient told us, it was like you're just some kind of number, you know, kind of like cattle. Get in through your little assessment and then go on to the next person, like swept under the rug. And a nephrologist felt the same way. They said, you can make the KT over B, which is our measure of adequacy, whatever you want. You can usually make the potassium whatever you want. You can feed patients protein but none of that is the patient's goal. We focus on all of these numbers, but that's really not what patients care about. So as people became increasingly frustrated which so, with what some people would refer to as kind of cookie cutter care, there's been increased um, both guideline body as well as regulatory interest in figuring out ways of how to drive more patient-centered and individualized care. These are just two examples of that. CMS convened one of these technical expert panels in 2017 that was focused on patient reported outcome measures. And what the group recommended was that CMS select measures for the QIP that were intended to capture and drive individualization of care. Going into this panel, I can tell you because I chaired it, CMS thought that we were gonna talk about quality of life. They thought we were gonna talk about satisfaction with care. And that's not what 50% of the patients want, 50% of the TEP want to talk about, and 50% were patients. They wanted to know, measure my clinic on how well they're taking care of me as an individual, develop a measure that does that. There was then a KDGO conference, that's one of our international organizations that was focused on dialysis initiation. They recommended moving away from this one size fits all approach to dialysis and better incorporating patient goals and preferences into care delivery. So again, this goal of individualization of care, and this has been echoed by other groups over the last number of years. But what I told you is that our existing quality measures emphasize clinical outcomes. The vast majority of them are biochemical or some kind of measure of healthcare utilization. And in fact, there's only one patient reported outcome quality measure in the QIP, and that's this experience of care survey. That experience of care survey is administered twice a year. And what I'll tell you is that fewer than 25% of patients in this country on dialysis actually complete the survey. It's useless in caring for our patients. So our current quality measures, they don't align with patient priorities. And some would argue that they actually limit the ability of providers to individualize care targets because we're going after these numbers that are set forward by the quality incentive program and by these protocols we're not necessarily given the levers, at least on an individual basis, to individualize our care. And so what I've told you is that we have a care delivery system and we have a regulatory environment that are really primed to drive population health. And so it leaves us with the question of how can more patient-centered care be encouraged within this context? And there are a number of challenges. As I alluded to before, these outcomes can be hard to quantify. We've got a very limited evidence base in nephrology in general, but we have a really limited evidence base when it comes to this kind of work. Um, and we also lack implementation knowledge. How do we actually execute on this on a population scale? And so that's where effectiveness and implementation research comes in. And so this is this idea of doing effectiveness research, but also studying implementation at the same time such that effective interventions can ultimately be incorporated into practice faster um, at the end of the research. 
And we're going to look at a couple examples of those. Um, the first is around using dialysis-related symptom prompts to improve care. And both Derek and Precious have been involved in this work. So I'm going to give you just a microcosm on this. So a little bit of, of background here. So we know that dialysis-related symptoms are really important to patients. We know that through a number of prioritization exercises that have been done. But we also know from evidence that many times clinical teams under-recognize and as a result, under-treat symptoms that patients are having. And that's in part due because they don't have a structured way of asking about the symptoms. And it's also in part due to the fact that patients don't necessarily volunteer uh, their symptoms. So many symptoms are common, cramps, itching, post-dialysis fatigue. And importantly, many of these symptoms happen during the dialysis treatment. A lot happen at home, but many are during the dialysis treatment. And that's particularly interesting to me because that means that it's actionable. It's actionable at the clinic level, which means it is potentially in the scope of the dialysis organization. And we also know from research that high symptom burdens associate with worse quality of life. Not just worse quality of life, but patients who have high symptom burdens, they are more likely to be hospitalized and they also have higher rates of death. And so the question is, is, you know, could dialysis related symptoms, could that be a quality measure? Could that help us drive more individualized care? Are they quantifiable and are they facility controlled? And so this is where this idea of using patient reported outcome measures come in. So a patient reported outcome is any report of the status of a patient's health that comes directly from the patient without interpretation by anyone else. And then a patient reported outcome measure is simply the instrument, oftentimes a survey that's used to capture the patient reported outcome. And there's growing evidence, particularly from the oncology population and the palliative care population, um, that using proms regularly and then having clinical teams follow up on them, that that can lead to improved outcomes. So there have been several systematic reviews published that include data from over 50 trials that show that regularly using PROMs and again, routinely following up on the results leads to fewer hospitalizations, improved symptoms and quality of life, and also, and importantly, improved patient activation and patient clinician communication. I'll show you data from the largest trial published to date. Again, this is an oncology population. It was done in 52 US oncology practices from 2017 to 2020. It included adults with advanced cancer. So patients were randomized to doing weekly symptom surveys that then generated alerts to their care teams about new symptoms or concerning symptoms that were raised on those surveys. Or they were randomized to usual care which was just typically having their nurse or physician ask them if they were having any symptoms. And what they found was that the group that was randomized to doing the routine surveys with clinician follow-up, that those patients had better symptom control over time. They also had better health-related quality of life over time, larger improvements. And in other data that I'm not showing you here, there was improvements um, in terms of hospitalizations as well as mortality among people that were completing the symptom prompts. So why might this happen? This is just a survey. Why is that gonna improve patient outcomes? So there are a number of um, potential pathways for affecting outcomes through um, using patient reported outcome measures. The first is when you administer a survey and the clinical team follows up with the patient about the responses, and I emphasize that's important, you are talking to the patient about something that's important to them. You're talking to them about a high priority. In dialysis, we find ourselves talking a lot about hemoglobin and phosphorus and did they get their vascular access checked? And I can tell you that's really, that's not very important to patients. But talking to them about something important is going to improve patient clinician communication, not only about symptoms, but likely about other health issues as well. And again, this has been demonstrated in the cancer population. And beyond that, there's the more obvious pathway, which is they should have better symptom management. So if the clinical team has better recognition of the problems, they can actually enact treatment plans and improve their outcomes that relate to symptoms. But there are some issues because we don't want to administer surveys and not follow up on them. And what I would argue is that prompts could be really detrimental to use in practice if you don't have a very good system for ensuring follow-up. And the reason for this is if we don't follow up on things that patients report on surveys, they can feel like their concerns were perceived as unimportant, that their time was unvalued, and also they're left with these unresolved problems that they reported on a survey and no one followed up with them about. 
So we really need systems that support the implementation of PROMs just as much as we need to figure out if using them actually improves care. So what do we do in regular practice in terms of symptom assessment? So the existing approaches are really non-standardized. This is actually goes uh, counter to some of the things I told you earlier in that care in clinics is often very protocolized. This is an area where there's not a protocol, so it is not standardized. So it tends to happen just through ad hoc uh, discussions between patients and their care teams. And then once a year, we ask people to do a health-related quality of life survey. And this has a domain that does ask questions about symptoms, but this is once a year. Um, Number of weaknesses to this approach, it's infrequent administration. This is once a year, I just said. Um, and there's also really inconsistent follow-up with patients. We don't have a system that ensures that patients' responses are followed up on. So in the United States, systems that support symptom reporting and follow-up have not been tested. So with that in mind, we developed a symptom prom a number of years ago. We started with a systematic review. We went through a number of development steps of this patient reported outcome measure. And it culminated in a pilot test where we were able to show essentially some potential preliminary efficacy and feasibility of this instrument. This is what it looks like. It's got a patient facing symptom survey that asks patients about specific symptoms. And then importantly, the system has a number of supports to help the care team follow up. Again, I said that follow up was really important. It sends emails to designated clinicians when severe, very severe or concerning symptoms are reported. Uh, it generates reports so you can look at symptoms over time and it's intended that you actually share these reports with the patients like a tool of engagement. And then there are also symptom guidances to help dialysis care teams. So in our preliminary work on this, we administered this survey over a four month period to about 65 patients and they took the survey close to 500 times. And again, in very underpowered work, it appeared that there was a trend toward improvement in symptoms. And there was also a trend toward improvement in some clinical outcomes, things like fewer mistreatments, things like fewer shortened treatments. And so what we showed was that using Smart HD, and we incorporated this into routine care, these were not done by coordinators, these were done by clinic staff. We showed that using the system was feasible. And in fact, we had an overall completion rate over the 16 week period of 84%. So that leads us to where we are now. So we're currently conducting a pragmatic clinical effectiveness trial that is, that is an effectiveness implementation trial that is comparing the smart HD system that I just told you about to routine care and determining its impact on outcomes, including symptoms and other clinical outcomes. And importantly, we're also evaluating the implementation of the system in routine care. Um, a number of partners in this work, a number of universities, Laura Denver at the University of Pennsylvania, Duke, the University of New Mexico, and our dialysis organization partner is Fresenius. So this is being done in 30 Fresenius uh, clinics across the country and will enroll over uh, 2,400 patients in this study. So what do we hope to learn and why does this matter? So yes, we're gonna learn hopefully something about the comparative effectiveness of these two approaches. But regardless of those findings, we hope that we will learn something about the implementation of patient reported outcomes in routine dialysis care. Will patients complete surveys, whether they're about symptoms or some other topic? And then how can a care team, how can they be supported to actually follow up on those surveys? So it's really this core question of what does it take to meaningfully implement patient report outcome measures in routine dialysis care? And this will be important as CMS drives toward including more patient report outcome measures in their quality incentive program. Um, and I wanna give a shout out since I'm here in Colorado to Lily Cervantes. We were able to get some supplemental funding for this award. And so Lily is helping us um, work on research that will hope Really extend research to more, indivi more Latinx individuals, specifically in kidney research. So we're doing work through interviews, elucidating barriers and facilitators to research participation. And then we're creating and implementing culturally concordant education training materials for the Smart HD study, but we'll hopefully generalize to other areas of kidney research. So I, I thank Lily for her collaboration in that regard. So this is the second trial. Um, so this is on patient education. Again, another effectiveness implementation trial. And this is on enhancing vascular access preparedness. So again, another very patient-centered approach. So a little background here. So initiating hemodialysis via, via what we call an arteriovenous or an AV access, which you know, as clinicians we think about as a fistula or a graft. 
rather than a catheter is considered best practice for most patients, and it has been for years. However, only about 20% of patients in the US actually start hemodialysis with a usable AV access. And there has been no improvement. And if I showed you the graph, you could actually see that this is getting worse in the last 20 years. So there are a number of system level reasons why this is hard. Getting an AV access is actually really complex. You've got to see all of these different doctors that you didn't know before. Two thirds of them don't work. You have to get extra procedures. There's a lot that happens with the patients. And there are also some individual health barriers. People's vasculature may not be suitable. Um, but there also is some new evidence that suggests that essentially insufficient patient preparedness also plays a role. But in the years past, all of the efforts to increase the rates of AV access prior to dialysis have really focused on the system level barriers. But those system level barriers don't address the patient experience. And what we know is that when patients are dealing with getting an AV access, they're also dealing with starting dialysis, which is an incredibly stressful time for people. They have lots of negative emotions, fear, denial, uncertainty. They have this lack of emotional preparedness, not just for AV access, but for dialysis in general. And there's also data that suggests that they lack knowledge and they have a lot of misconceptions about AV access. When we interviewed patients about their experience in getting an AV access, one patient with chronic kidney disease told us, when I first heard about it, needing an AV access, it actually made me not want to come back. So I just shut it off. I just didn't want to face it. So I didn't go. So they stopped seeing their nephrologist when they started talking about getting an access. So we know from other areas of kidney disease, as well as certainly in other populations, that targeted education for patients can improve outcomes. And in kidney disease, specifically targeted education has been shown to increase the rates of home dialysis, as well as transplant pursuit, as well as improve um, outcomes among people who do get a transplant. And also in other serious illness conditions, um, enhancing educational and emotional preparedness has been shown to really help patients cope with uncertainties related to their condition. And there's a ton of uncertainty when we are preparing patients for start for dialysis because we don't even know when they're gonna need to start. Um, and it's also this educational and emotional preparedness has been shown to help patients engage in complex care processes. And I just told you that getting an AV access is actually a complex care process. So with this in mind, we developed um, some educational materials a number of years ago. We started with focus groups, we did preliminary interviews, and then we went through an iterative process with input from patients as well as clinicians and ultimately developed um, a final video and final brochure. So these materials called Getting Ready, Your Vascular Access Journal, pairs the story of a patient and her journey of getting a vascular access with educational concepts for patients. But the intent of them is really to acknowledge the emotional aspect of getting an access and to put that front and center. The materials also acknowledge a lot of the detours that happens to patients as they follow on their path. So there's accesses that don't work and they need additional procedures. Many patients don't know that that's gonna happen. And this puts it front and center. So what are we doing now with this? So again, this is another one of those hybrid effectiveness implementation trials. So we're currently conducting a trial that compares the effectiveness of three education strategies. Two of them use the materials, I'll show them to you in a second. Um, for increasing the proportion of patients who have an AV access created prior to dialysis start. So this is among advanced CKD patients. But we're also studying implementation of the education strategies, again, to guide their translation in the post-trial setting. Again, multiple collaborators, recruiting sites are UNC and Penn, and our implementation um, and disparities focus work is being done by Hopkins. So in this trial, there is a system level intervention that all participants are getting. Um, and that is we're prompting the nephrologist that they actually might need to refer the patient for vascular access. Because we know from some of our preliminary data, one of the challenges of getting people an AV access is the fact that the nephrologist doesn't want to admit that their patient might need an AV access. So we're, we're prompting, prompting nephrologists no matter what their randomization status is. And patients are being randomized at the, at the patient level. So they're randomized to usual care, which is just their typical education they get from their nephrologist. And then they're also going to their local CKD education class. 
Um, they could be randomized to education, which is usual care plus just getting the material, getting the getting ready materials. This is basically passive transition of the education. And then the third group is education plus. And in these patients, they get usual care, but they also get telehealth motivational interviewing, um, and they also get the getting ready materials, but it's only in the context of them being determined to be ready for the materials through their engagement with motivational interviewing. So what do we wanna learn from this? So again, we will learn comparative effectiveness of these three approaches to vascular access education. But regardless of those findings, the trial should inform implementation of other types of kidney related education. What aspects of education programs are important to patients? And how can education be better incorporated into routine care? So again, at the heart of it, what does it take to meaningfully educate and prepare patients for dialysis? I wanna shift gears a little bit and now talk about how we can meaningfully engage stakeholders in our research. The two trials that I told you about and all of the development work that was done for them were heavily stakeholder engaged work. And what I submit to you is that your work will always benefit with engaging with the people directly impacted by your research, hard stop. You know, whether that's a clinical program, whether that's policy, whether it's research, involve the people who are directly impacted by your work. That's often termed stakeholder engagement. A stakeholder is an individual who has experience living with, caring for, advocating for, or treating those with a condition. Basically, they touch the condition in some form. And engagement, particularly in the research context, at least by PCORI is defined, is the interaction partnership between researchers and stakeholders for the mutually beneficial transfer of knowledge, methods, and resources. But that applies to other things. It applies to policy, it applies to clinical programs. Now in the dialysis community, there are a number of stakeholders. So we have patients, their care partners, we have those medical teams that I told you about in the clinics. We have these dialysis organizations, which are these huge structured companies. Then we have innovators, we have investigators. And then on the regulatory side of things, we have regulatory makers and we have policy makers. And so when we're developing research, what I'm arguing is that in some way, including them, not only in the development, the testing of that research, that will ultimately allow you to speed the uptake of the findings um, into practice. So the work that I told you about began with some stakeholder engagement that began about eight years ago. So prior to having the PCORI Award for the Pragmatic Trial, we had an engagement award. And the point of the engagement award, our goal was to try to increase the research capacity of dialysis clinics. So I told you about all this infrastructure, but at the end of the day, when you're doing research in a dialysis clinic, you're doing it in a clinic, there are care teams, there are many people that work in those clinics, and the vast majority of them have no connection to research whatsoever. And so through this two-year award, we sought to understand the barriers and facilitators to doing research in the dialysis clinics, and also to understand the needs of how could we engage clinic personnel in, in the research. And so as part of this work, we held a national workshop where we have representatives from seven different dialysis organizations. We had patients, people there from CMS and all of our national organizations. And ultimately we developed what we call this research education toolkit, which is a video as well as written materials um, for people working in clinics. It's for patients, but it's also for clinic staff. Again, trying to get buy-in, trying to improve our ability to do research. The trial that I told you about is also intensely stakeholder supported. We have a stakeholder panel, we have a patient work group. These are pictures from an in-person gathering that we had last year. Again, we have members of multiple dialysis organizations involved. Um, while our work is being done in a single dialysis organization, we're getting input from numerous organizations. Again, with the idea of that we do the research in a way that it'll yield findings that can actually be used by different organizations. This is just an example of a stakeholder driven change. Um, so when we were doing some of the development of our smart HD study, the patients said, we really like to see a video. We think that you could get patients in clinics more excited, more likely to be engaged in this if it was patients talking to patients. Well, I'm enrolling 2,400 people in this trial. I can't take my patient partners around to talk with them individually. And so they suggested that we make a video. So we ultimately shot a video that explains the study, but I think more importantly than that, it includes a number of our patient and family member partners talking about why the study is important to them. 
Um, the video will be used pre-study in clinics where we're conducting the trial um, to spark patient and clinic personnel buy-in. And we also use it for public dissemination. But stakeholder engagement, while I would argue it is incredibly beneficial to your work. It's also really hard. It rolls off the tongue pretty easily, but I can tell you on a day-to-day -day basis, it's tough. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. So there are unequal relationships. I will hold a stakeholder panel and I literally will have the chief medical office of, officer of a company sitting there. And then I will have a patient who may not have even gone to college and they're sitting at the same table. So we're starting off with unequal relationships. And depending on people's background, there may be mistrust. And this isn't just mistrust between patients and providers and organizations, it's also mistrust among the stakeholders. People wonder, well, does the dialysis organization really wanna help patients or do they just wanna make money? There's a lot of undertones that go into this. There are also issues with participation. So if you have stakeholders, if you don't have their buy-in, you've, you've got to have a shared goal and you have to establish that from the start. Um, you also can have a high burden of involvement. We may be asking people to come to meetings. We may be asking people to travel. And some of our stakeholders, the ones whose, in, whose perspectives it's probably most important to gain, can't do that. And then as I alluded to before, there's a limited understanding of research concepts. So you've got to get everyone on the same page just in terms of what research is. There are gaps in communication. And then there are often undefined and then unmet expectations. And finally, there's a the resource issue. Not only do people have com competing um, demands for their time and priorities, there's limited time and money. It's hard to get this funded and it's expensive to do this work, but it's necessary. So these are some principles of stakeholder engagement that I've, I've kind of put together over the years from working with, with a variety of people. And I think the number one thing that's most important to do from the start is really foster this shared commitment to the project value is, and goals. Because no matter what happens, no matter who gets upset, no matter what feathers you ruffle, you can always go back to the fact that you have a common goal. You're playing on the same team. Respect individual stakeholder expertise. Every person is there for a reason and every person has expertise. And then also this idea of building trust through transparency. When you make a mistake, and I have made numerous of those, own it, say it, and say it out loud. And I find that being transparent around that makes an enormous difference when you're building these relationships. And you can't communicate enough. Um, and the way that we have handled this in the past, because I have left people frustrated because they didn't hear from me often enough, is that usually at the start of this, we'll, we'll develop and we'll co-develop a communication plan that says, this is the cadence you're expecting to hear from me. This is what I'm going to do. And we agree to that. Um, and again, it really helps with transparency. And then finally, you have to take the time to equip stakeholders for meaningful involvement. And you have to make it easy for them. You can't have someone who requires dialysis three times a week, who doesn't want to travel, to all of a sudden show up for an in-person meeting. You've got to make this easy. A lot of our patients don't use Zoom. So, so how can you make it possible for people to contribute? Um, and then finally, it's just recognizing the iterative nature of the process. You've got to be flexible and responsive. And for all the work that I've done over the years, I had an idea going in, and I can assure you that idea looked pretty different on the backside but you've got to be flexible. So in conclusion, what I hope I've given you is some level of a vision of how you might be able to leverage effectiveness implementation research to inform any kind of care that you do. And I gave you the example of dialysis care. So for in order for us to realize individualized person-centered dialysis care, there are a number of factors that need to be in place. First of all, the people that make the decisions, this is policymakers, this is dialysis organizations, they have to have the information necessary to make informed decisions. And that includes around outcome and cost ratios, which is value-based care. So to do that, they need information about clinical care. This is where that effectiveness and implementation research can come in. So you actually generate the evidence um, and hopefully as well as supportive workflows. And you also need to support sustainability. So you need to be working toward things that are important to patients, and you also have to have aligned policy and reimbursement in this setting. And what I would argue is that the dialysis environment is really a perfect environment for this. We have the policy, 
we have the delivery system. So as researchers, we can not only bring the research, but we can also keep the policymakers focused on what's important to patients. And the examples I've given you is one way to do that is through this effective implementation research, again, that's deeply informed uh, by stakeholders. So with that, I'll close. Um, and again, thank you for having me. It's just been a complete thrill to be here. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm happy to take some questions. I think we have about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll start with questions from our audience. Dr. Joe. Dr. Fly, thank you so much. What a, what a great talk. Um, you know, I do a lot of work in quality and safety myself. And one of the challenges that I've experienced is how do you take the patient's voice using qualitative data and try to create quantifiable metrics that can scale nationally? You start off by telling us all of the, the numbers that people use, but the story behind the numbers gets lost. Uh, are there examples of where you've seen that work well? And then what would that look like in an ideal state for you as you think about the work you're doing at a national level? Sure. No, it's a, it's, it's a great question. I think it's what our community is wrestling with now is it's they know they want to do this, but how do you actually operationalize it? And so I tell you a little bit about the story from the technical expert panel that I mentioned in 2017 that was on patient reported outcomes. And again, CMS was looking for evidence as well as advice from the community about what patient report outcome would be important to include in the quality incentive program. And this was this idea of more measures that would drive individualized care. And so the TEP came away with talking about what they called life goal directed care. They really wanted the care that a patient got in the clinic to match what that patient wanted to get. So CMS took that and they actually developed a life goal measure um, they went through the full process of evaluating its properties, and there now is a life goal measure. Uh, I can tell you that in just a few weeks, there will be another technical expert panel that is specifically on that life goal measure, and there's a lot of discussion about now incorporating that or something like that into the quality incentive program. Now, it's not perfect, um, but it's a step in the right direction. And so it's a survey that has five questions that basically says is, you know, did the dialysis care team ask about your life goals? Are they doing things for you to try to help reach them? And then there's a way to score it, and then that will be used. So that's an example. I do think that patient report outcome mothers, whether it's health-related quality of life or even symptoms or other, other potential opportunities. What an excellent talk. Um, it was uh, really eye-opening to look at all this effectiveness implementation research. My question was about your SMART HD trial where you use the patient reported outcomes. What is um, the process? Do you uh, use it concurrent with a dialysis visit or is it just emailed separately uh, uh, the uh, survey? And what is the timeline for the physicians to respond? To I am missing, the, I, I can't hear the question. Um, sorry, uh, um, I wanted to ask about the SMART HD. And um, I just wanted to know what was the uh, process for survey implementation? Do you email uh, these surveys to the patients? Oh, for actually how do we administer the symptom surveys? How, and how do the physicians respond? Is there a timeline that you have to respond within two weeks or four weeks? To yep, the great. No, those are great questions. So they're being administered on tablet computers at the dialysis clinic. And in the cancer data that I showed you, they could do them at the clinic or they could be emailed links. But in this case, we want to collect the data at the clinic. And so it's actually a workflow where the people taking care of them administer the surveys on tablet computers. The alerts go to, we're required for them to go to a medical provider, but they also go to nurses. Um, and the idea is that we suspect it'll be nurses that actually follow up about the symptoms. But the trial does not mandate that they do that. It gives them supports to do it, but it doesn't mandate that they actually do the follow-up. We're leaving that in the hands of the care team, and that's part of the pragmatic aspect of the trial. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was wondering, on the slide, uh, with the trial for the oncological practice where they initially started using PROMS, it looked like there was a really sharp improvement and then kind of a convergence between the groups. Did that inform anything about your current trial to hopefully see longer term effectiveness and implementation of PROMS? 
Yeah, no, I think it's it's a great question. And I, I think the even bigger question is what, whether what you see in this cancer population is going to translate to dialysis. And I think part of the reason that you see those slopes is those patients in the cancer trials were advanced cancer patients. So these are patients that are oftentimes getting palliative chemo that has lots of symptoms. And so I think some of the changes that you see, you're more likely to see them faster. They're also coming to the clinic. They're there are things that you can do. You can stop the chemotherapy. You can change agent. Um, and in dialysis, I think it's, it's less clear if that's going to be the case. The other thing that we didn't know going into this is how frequently we should collect the information. It's different in an oncology environment because it's probably a time-limited interaction, you know, whether because they're cured or because they go on to discontinue chemotherapy. In dialysis, we're talking about potentially years of care. So how frequently should we do this? Um, and in cancer, they did it weekly, but I tried doing it weekly among our patients and they got very frustrated. I tried doing it monthly. That wasn't enough. And so in the trial, we're doing it twice a month. But I think that those are, those are unanswered questions and whether or not people will be willing to do it for long periods of time is also one of the things that, that we're trying to answer. Dr. Cervantes. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, question for you regarding those um, cancer trials that have looked at PROMS and clinical outcomes, have they published on um, the cost effectiveness or done economic analyses? And is this something you plan to do as well? So they have done some of the cost analyses and some of those are published and they do appear to be cost effective over time, what likely largely because of the, the decrease in hospitalizations associated with them. Within the construct of our existing study, we cannot do cost effectiveness analysis because Corey actually uh, historically has not allowed you to do that. That's changing, I believe, but currently you're not allowed to build that into the work that you do that's PCORI funded. Um, but ideally in the long run, that will be important because a lot of what we're making, the argument that we're trying to make to dialysis organizations, is it's got to be a value-based argument. But I don't know that I need the numbers if we can actually show that you decrease hospitalizations, which is a source of expense, not only to Medicare, but it is one of the things that's in the quality incentive program. So, you know, if we can reduce hospitalizations and reduce readmissions, then patients are in the clinic getting their treatment. It should be cost savings. Deal with questions as we have a second. Um, we've been talking about dialysis, but we're mostly talking about inpatient intermittent hemodialysis. What do we know about, say, peritoneal dialysis, which you know takes away those presumptions in terms of its effectiveness, cost, patient tolerance, those kind of things? Uh, in terms of patient symptom burden on peritoneal dialysis, uh, all of it. You know, if we look at what this costs, how it how it functions, how it works, I know it's much more commonly used outside of the U.S. How does that compare? do on intermittent hemodialysis? Well, I mean, peritoneal dialysis is regulated in the same way that hemodialysis is in terms of being covered by Medicare. They have slightly different uh, quality measures, but they're all relevant to the procedure. I think in general, peritoneal dialysis is definitely tolerated better by patients. Um, it's more physiologic, right? Rather than doing what your body does uh, every hour, every day, you know, we do it three times a week in center and peritoneal dialysis is much more physiologic. Um, but we do know, and there's emerging data, although there's been less work done, is that peritoneal dialysis patients have real symptoms too. They get abdominal fullness, constipation can be a major source of discomfort for patients. And there are also slightly different dietary restrictions for peritoneal dialysis patients. And so they have their own symptom experiences and their own, you know, quality of life issues that are related to their treatment. But I do think in general, most people feel like they're slightly lesser, but it also, at least in the United States, tends to be at a lot of times of our, our, our healthier or slightly more functional patients end up on home therapies. So much for coming. Um, I was really interested in how you used community stakeholders and also policymakers to help inform your research. How did you decide which policymakers to include in that initial part that informed your research? And how did that process go in terms of their involvement going forward? Sure. And it's hard, right, to get someone from kind of policy level. So in the very early work, we really started more with advocacy organizations. So both on the patient and professional side of things that had kind of direct interaction with regulators and policymakers. As we've progressed, we do have a representative from CMS who's on our, our broader stakeholder panel. And it's someone that's in their, their kidney office um, who is interested in, you know, outcomes that are important to patients and how CMS can better, you know, 
better address population level. So at that level, we have gotten to that, but we didn't start there. I think we're right at one o'clock. So Dr. Flight, thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you. Thank you.